Okay, unfortunately, a bit disorganized today because of the confusion with the room, but um, I'm, I'm thinking, I always say this, but, <laughs> and it never works out in the end. I always say this, but I, I have a feeling that this might be a short class today because, yeah, I would say that, but it never never works out. Uh, I have a feeling because, well, really, what, what, what's going on here? Like, as far as the plot is concerned, right? There's not, I guess there's a lot of showmanship and stuff going on, but we're on chapters 10. Nine and ten, sorry, nine and ten. Nine's a long chapter, but all it is is plot, right? There's not a lot of philosophy in it, I guess you could say. Well, I, I, I kind of want to take that back, maybe. Maybe. What happens? It's the age of miracles. So where do we leave off? We left off at the end of chapter nine, right? We got uh, Unk and Boaz on Mercury, and they escape. Well, not they, just, um, just Unk. Boaz decides to stay behind with his beautiful, lovely harmoniums. And um, when we get to the next chapter, where are we at? We're on Earth, right? Springtime in the northern hemisphere of Earth. And remember, there's this new religion. Let's write all this down. The Church of the God of the Utterly Indifferent. Church. God of utterly indifferent. And someone help me out here. What what is the, the, the two main teachings of the church? What basically are the two doctrines? We went over this last time, didn't we? No one took notes. What are the two doctrines of the church? One of them has to do with luck. They both have to do with God. No one? Yeah, that's the second one, right. I kind of want to find the, the, the actual, the, but you're right. That's what it, like, luck is, luck is not the hand of God. I want to get the wording just right, though. Where's, what page is this on? Page 7, I think. Page 183, I think. So nope, that's not it. Say, 257? Where are you looking at on 257? At the top? Yeah, luck is not the hand. Yeah, but that's the, that's the second one. Where's the first one, though? Yeah, I still think, again, like he, he introduces it at the end of uh, chapter 7. Two chief, this is on 183. Two chief teaching of the religion. And uh, I'll write the second one here because you gave it to me. Um, luck is not the hand of God. And the first one says, puny man can do nothing at all to help or please God Almighty. All right, so puny man cannot... Can do, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna short. I'm gonna shorten it because I don't have room up here on the board, right? But basically, can do nothing at all to help or please Almighty God. Not help or please God. 
So those are the only two teachings, right? That are the two chief teachings. I don't want to go to the only teachings of this religion. <clears throat> There's a, a the flag of the church, right? Has a slogan says t saying, "Take care of the people, and God Almighty will take care of Himself." So this is a sort of, um, you know, obviously God of the utterly indifferent. This, this is, I don't want to say it's the apathetic God. Ap apathy is kind of a negative quality, right? At least that's how it's usually portrayed. If you're apathetic, it's like you lack any passion or whatnot. But this is just sort of the God that doesn't really care one way or the other. It doesn't care what you do, what you don't do. It's not concerned with all that. Now, maybe this is just me sort of just throwing something out there. Maybe... Maybe this is God in, uh, in Vonnegut's universe? What is this? What's UWTB? Who remembers what that was? We only went over it really briefly. It's kind of a silly concept, but it's one of those concepts that like he just made up, kind of like the chrono, the chronosynclastic infundibulum. Remember the chronosynclastic infundibulum. Love, right, another one of his creations, right? This is where all truth kind of fits together and everything agrees. But what's the UWTB? That's short for what? The universal will to become. Universal will to become. It's what makes nothing become something. It's what makes everything in the universe be what it is, become what it is. So you could argue, there's some that have argued that this is sort of Vonnegut's God in this novel. That's pretty much God. And it's not much of a God. It's just, he doesn't say much about it, doesn't explain much about it. He's like, well, there's just this thing in the universe called the universal will to become. And this is what the, this is the alien on, uh, that's waiting on Titan. Remember Salo? He's an alien waiting for the part for his ship for thousands of years or something on Titan. This is, this is uh, he, he knows Rumford, remember? He, he's able to use, he's got a supply. He's got a supply of this. So apparently you can store it up. And he uses the w, uh, UWTB to, to uh, power the war, the, the invasion of Mars, or sorry, of Earth by the Martians. So um, in chapter 10 and 11, <clears throat> we're getting pretty close to the end of the book. And what we get is, well, at, well, at the end of chapter, at the end of chapter nine, Unk is boarding the spaceship and leaving. And uh, Boaz is, you know, happy to stay, thinks he's been a good boy. He's going to die a good death, even if he dies just with these weird creatures, right? He's happy. He's content. But poor Unk, right? Unk is still lost. He still has no home, but he pushes the on button and heads back to Earth, right? Um, what exactly goes on when he gets there, though? Right? He shows up to some church, right, of the Reverend C. Horner Renwine, uh, this guy who's a part of the church of the utterly indifferent, the God of the utterly indifferent, and they were expecting him, right? They knew he was going to show up. How, how does he react when he gets to Earth? How do you think you would react if you were punk? He just crashes in, and he's like, you know, he's naked. He crashes into some churchyard. There's like smoke everywhere. And there's a whole crowd of people waiting for him because they knew he was coming, right? So, yeah. He runs back to his spaceship and hides. <laughs> and they're like peering in there like at a goldfish in a freaking bowl or something, right? Um... But yeah, all this stuff was staged. I mean, it's, it's not staged. Well, I guess, I guess in a certain sense it was. Like, uh, Rumford knew about what was going to happen, when it was going to happen. So he had all these things planned. And uh, Unk shows up. He's got this, this, this space suit or this lemon yellow suit that's supposed to be skin tight that he has to wear. What, is it, what does it have on it? Yeah, it's got a big question mark on the front. 
and a big question mark on the back, which is kind of appropriate because this guy's completely lost, right? He has no idea like what he's there for and what he's supposed to be doing. And uh, it seems like he's a really special person, right? All these people are like really excited about him showing up. And I guess so, because remember what's, what's going on on Earth uh, during this time? They just won the war against Mars, but did they really win? In a way, they didn't. Why? What's wrong? They feel bad about it. They feel horrible about it. They feel really guilty about it. And so, how do you think they're going to feel when a survivor shows up from the Martian army? You know, like, let's say that you thought, you, you thought you, maybe you pushed a button on, 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 you know, on the control panel and you uh, accidentally killed a bunch of people. You'd pre feel pretty freaking crummy about it, right? Well, what if you found out one of them was still alive? How would that make you feel? A little bit better, a little bit better. You still feel crummy for what you did, but hey, at least there's a survivor. So I guess that's kind of like, oh, okay, he's here in Martian. They're kind of celebrating and, and he shows up. He's the last Martian to arrive. Uh, you know, he, his ship was, I guess, a little slower than the rest, three, three years uh, a little bit late. And um, he gets the sense, right, that he's, He's really welcome. He gets the sense that they're like, he's supposed to be like this big spectacle. And then he starts to get nervous, right? He's like, I don't feel like I'm worthy of this. Like I have to go out and make a speech basically. And he doesn't know what the hell he's supposed to say, right? And, and, the, and the, the, pre, the preacher, the reverend is like, you'll know what to say. Just say whatever comes to mind, you know? And he's like, I don't know what to say. He's like, they're gonna ask you a couple of questions and just answer them directly, right? And this is just, to me, brilliant, I, I think, completely brilliant. <laughs> because what do they ask him, right? Um, <laughs> this is, uh, okay, he says, the congregation spoke as one. So this is him getting out of the spaceship, finally. Like, you know, he gets coaxed out of there. He's like, you know, scared. And the reverend's like, come on out, come on out. So the congregation spoke as one, and they said, who are you? I, uh, I don't know my real name, said Unc. They call me Unc. What happened to you, said the congregation. Unc shook his head vaguely. He could think of no apt condens uh, condensation of his adventures for the obviously ritual mood. Something great was plainly expected of him, and he was not up to greatness. He exhaled noisily, letting the congregation know that he was sorry to fail them with his colorlessness. I was a victim of a series of accidents, he said. He shrugged as are we all. The cheering and dancing began again. So people like, people freaked out when he said that. They're like, yeah, like, like oh my God, he said it. Ah! What did he say? I was a victim of a series of accidents, as are, as are we all, right? Unk was hustled aboard the fire engine and driven on it to the door of the church. Redwine pointed amiably to an unfurled wooden scroll over the door. Incised in the scroll and gilded were these words. I was a victim of a series of accidents, as are we all. So he's like, this is just, again, a part of this prophecy. I was, all in bold letters, I was a victim of a series of accidents. As are we all. So I guess this fits in nicely with the, the with the doctrine, with the dogma of the religion. Um, luck is not, at least especially the second part that you mentioned, Milagros. The luck is not the hand of God, right? We're all just a uh, we're all just a victim of a series of accidents. Some of them lucky, some of them unlucky, right? And there's a kind of a camaraderie in this. Remember. Uh, Rumford wanted to bring about a brotherhood of man with his new religion. So I guess the idea, the acknowledgement is that we're all in this together. We're all stuck in this, uh, this world that we can't control. We're all the victim of a series of accidents. And this is a sort of, I guess, letting go and accepting one's fate, to sort of accept one's fate. What's uh, one of the weird things about this religion? How do they practice their faith? What are, what are some of the things they do? 
they mention that there's this symbol called a Malachi. Right? Remember, Malachi Constant is the name of Unk. That's Unk's real name. But in this religion, they have these symbols. You'll find out about one of them in the next chapter, the fountain. Remember the fountain at the beginning of the book with the bowls, right? That's also part of this religion, right? They're selling it as a, as a religious object at the mansion. What else do they sell? They sell these things called Malachi's. What are they? It's like hanging from the bell. He describes it hanging from the bell in the church. Well, it's a doll with a noose around its neck. And it's supposed to represent what you're not supposed to be. Malachi. Remember what kind of guy Malachi was back on earth? What was he? How would you describe Malachi Constant? A douche. <laughs> Is that what you said? Be more specific. How's he a douche? I agree, but what do you mean by that? He's just a party animal. He just go through women and booze and, and, and waste money and, and didn't really care about much except for just getting his kicks off, right? And so this is sort of an effigy of him, right? Hanging by a noose or something. And it's, I guess that's against the religion. And, 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 and this makes it sound like maybe this new religion is a bit um, ascetic. I don't know if we've covered this term, asceticism. Right? An ascetic is somebody who deprives themselves of any sensual pleasure, right? So sex, food, anything, you name it. Life is about just, you know, detach yourself from that. And then you'll live a more dignified life. You could argue that what, what's her name? Bee, Beatrice, tries to embody that with her. Doesn't want to get dirty. Wants to stay pure and clean and never get roughed up. Wants to be that girl in the white dress with the white horse, with the white gloves, etc. She, could, she should embody, I guess, maybe the ascetic ideal, the pure ideal. Whereas he's like the opposite of that. He's like this hedonistic, you know, it's all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll and just getting my kicks, and I don't really care. It's all about the physical, sensual pleasures. Um, this makes it seem like the new religion is a sort of ascetic religion, but I don't think it is either. You're going to see with the speeches that are given by Rumford at the end that Rumford actually is critical of both Malachi and of B, that they both have sinned against the, this new religion. They both have sinned, right? Malachi, because he was too dirty, and I guess B, because she was too clean, right? You know, he was just too filthy, he was a pig, but she didn't have any fun. She just didn't want to get dirty or, or get her hands wet or anything like, get her feet wet or anything like that. But what else do they do in this new religion? This is one thing I find kind of odd. I don't, know if I, I don't know if I quite follow Vonnegut on this. I'm not sure if I like it either. What do people do in this new religion? They have these things called handicaps. You know what I'm talking about? What, what do they do? They get rid of their so-called luck. They, their luck? Yeah, they get rid of their luck. Right. Like anything that, that could be seen as an advantage, they get rid of it. So, like, you give some examples. Like, what, what kind of stuff do they do? Right, like, the really, if you're really attractive, like he says, the beautiful women would put on, like, really obnoxious makeup and wear frumpy clothing and make their posture ugly or something like that. If they're really strong, put a bunch of weight on their shoulders so they have to carry a bunch of weight or something like that. So this is a sort of, like, egalitarianism, I guess. This sort of, like, everyone has to be equal or the same. I don't know if I like this, right? but I guess the idea is, is is that there's no animosity between anybody else. Is the idea right? Is that we all have our burdens and no one has any unfair advantage or something like that? I guess it's to try to get rid of the luck aspect of this. But yeah, you're right. So yeah, there's all sorts of. I think the what is it the uh, the, the the reverend has all these weights on. Him. Right, like he he lifts his hand up, and he's got like a bag full of metal on his wrists and stuff. <clears throat> Some of these people have like grates, you know, like a big furnace grate on their on their chest. Um, so what's basically planned uh, for this poor guy, Unk? They put him on a freaking fire engine and they drive him to the mansion to uh, for the final show, the grand finale, and. Um, who else is there? Who is he? Who is he finally reunited with? 
What's that? Yeah, B and chrono. So we've got, you know, we've got unk and B and chrono. And these are like pretty much like, I guess you could throw salo in here. But for the rest of the book, these are pretty much the characters, right? So when you finish reading it this weekend, you're, you're going to finally figure out what happens to these characters. And you'll learn a little bit more about Salo. So I don't think, you're, I don't think anybody's really in a, in a position right now, a good position to write your essay yet. Because the, the essay topic is who lives the most meaningful life. And I said if I wrote the essay today and I hadn't read the last few chapters, these people wouldn't qualify. We have to kind of see what happens when they get to Titan and how things work out for them, if they work out at all. But what sort of, yeah, you're laughing. Did you get that far yet? Okay, yeah, you, yeah. I thought you did because you laughed, but yeah, wait till you see. It kind of does work out, but in a very comical way, you know, in a very comical way. Um, it, perhaps that's another theme of the novel is that there are all these expectations that the characters have and they're never fulfilled. So, you know, the people who are waiting for the space wanderer even, you could even argue even the incidental characters, a lot of them are chasing dreams. You know, um, the crowd outside the mansion waiting for the, the guy to materialize. Is he gonna bring us some truth and make our lives have meaning? They're all looking for something higher. They're all looking for something greater, some big, great scheme to kind of put it all together to explain things. And they all pretty much fail at that, except for the few that kind of, I guess, <laughs> resolve to their luck and just sort of accept where they're at, like Boaz did, and just sort of figure out, well, hey, here's, here, I'm stuck with this. I can't control it. Let me learn how to deal with it the best I can, make the most of it, and appreciate what I do have. And, all I have are these harmoniums, these little like creatures that have suction cups or whatever the heck. Um, what can you say about B and Chrono though from the, these two chapters? What have they been up to? So they survived, right? How did they survive? Do you remember that part? What did they do to survive the, so they, they landed like in South America in the middle of like the, the Amazon, the middle of like the rainforest or whatever. And they were like surrounded by a bunch of like indigenous, you know, tribal people or whatnot. What happened to them after that? You remember that part? They don't really go over that that in that detail, that much detail, but it's kind of kind of humorous. They wanted to eat them. They were gonna kill them, but why didn't they? They noticed something that about Chrono that that set him apart. Well let, let's let's uh, let's read a little bit about Chrono. So, so this we, we, we see them there. What are they doing? Y'all at least remember that part. What, what are, what are B and Chrono doing at the mansion? They're there, right? What are they doing there? They sell what? Yeah, they sell the Malachi's, right? Yeah, they sell the little trinkets at this concession. So before, you know, I guess every 59 days, Rumford shows up and everybody's waiting for him. So whenever he shows up, Everybody that, everybody that survived, or most people that survived from Mars were given jobs to do this, right? And they all hate Rumford too, right? Like they all can't stand him. They're like, you're a dick. Everybody else loves him, thinks he's great. You know, they've started this new religion. Uh, you know, the people, the crowd, all, all the Martians are like completely indifferent, don't even care or whatever. So, so yeah, B and Chrono are working the concession stands outside. They're selling Malachi's. And we learn a little bit about Chrono. We'll learn a lot more about him when we get to the end of the book, when he gets to Titan. Um, eight minutes, said Chrono, looking at his watch, because he's counted down the time before, before the materialization. Um, eight minutes, looking at his watch. He was 11 earthling years old. He was dark and smoldering. He was an expert short changer and was clever with cards. He was foul-mouthed and carried a switch knife and a six-inch blade. Chrono would not socialize well with other children and his reputation for dealing with life courageously and directly was so bad that only a few very foolish and very pretty little girls were attracted to him. Chrono was classified by the Newport Police Department and by the Rhode Island State Police as a juvenile delinquent. He knew at least 50 law enforcement officers by their first name and was a veteran of 14 lie detector tests. All that prevented Chrono's being placed in an institution was the finest legal staff on earth 
the legal staff of the Church of God of the Utterly Indifferent. Under the direction of Rumford, the staff defended Crono against all charges. So what's this kid, what's he kind of like? What would you say about Crono if you had to describe him? He's a bad boy, right? He's a bad kid. He's a little, he's a little juvenile delinquent, a little criminal, right? Um, what's up with his mom though too? What's happened to her? She's like one-eyed now and she lost all her teeth and they both turned like a gold color because of the diet they were eating when they were captured by these natives. Forgot the exact diet or whatnot. But they're, um, they're quite a tragic pair, I guess. They've been through a lot, it sounds like. They almost died together, right? And the only thing that saved them, nobody remembers? What, what was it that Chrono had that, that kind of saved their life in the, in the Amazon? This is on 238. The color of bee and Chrono's skins were permanent since it stemmed from a modification of their livers. Their livers had been modified by a three month diet consisting of water and the roots of Salpa Salpa or Amazonian blue poplar. The diet had been part of Bee's and Chrono's initiation into the Gumbo tribe. During the initiation, mother and son had been staked at the ends of tethers in the middle of the village, with Chrono representing the sun and Bee representing the moon, as the sun and the moon were understood by the Gumbo people. As a result of their experiences, Bee and Chrono were closer than most mothers and sons. They had been rescued at last by a helicopter. Winston Niles Rumford had sent the helicopter to just the right place at the right time. That's not what I was looking for. I was looking for like when they first landed. What saves them? Nobody remembers this? It's his good luck, his good luck piece. What, what's his good luck piece? What is it anyway? Who remembers that? It's just a piece of metal. It's like a little ribbon piece of metal, a couple holes in it. What were you gonna say? Yeah, and he just got it at like a factory for fire, fire, not, was it fire, it was flamethrowers. It was a flamethrowing factory, right? I don't know if that's supposed to be symbolic of anything. Um, but yeah, he, he visited a flamethrowing factory in, uh, when he was on Mars in school and some guy was walking around and I guess he got his foot stuck on a piece of metal and got mad at it, pulled it up, and threw it around, and banged it, cut it into like three or four pieces because it kept tearing into his feet. Got all angry, and then, the, and then when the kids walked off, Chrono saw this piece and picked it up and just kind of messes with it, holds on to it. And been holding on to it for his whole life. And uh, he's even, I think, messing with it now, right? He's like using it to clean his fingernails or something like that, right? So it's like, so here they are at the, at the freaking mansion, and, um, this is supposed to be, I, I guess, the, the, the climax, right? This is like the grand finale. I mean, it's not the last chapter, but this is sort of like the greatest show on earth. I mean, what, what's happened to the mansion? He's got all these, these platforms and scaffoldings built all over the mansion, Rumford does. So he can just walk around and kind of talk to the crowd and everybody can see him. And they're packed to the gills in the mansion. It's, you know, just packed with people. And he gives this speech, right? He brings, uh, he brings uh, Unk before the crowd. Let me find where it begins. So he's, I think it's 247, where he kind of starts talking about the space traveler. And then we'll get to the part about B. So welcome space wanderer, Blood and Rumford's oleo margarine tenor from the Gabriel horns on the wall. How meet it is that you should come to us on the bright red pumper of a volunteer fire, fire department. I can think of no more stirring symbol of man's humanity to man than a fire engine. Tell me, space wanderer, do you see anything here? Anything that makes you think you may have been here before? The space wanderer murmured something unintelligible. Louder, please, said Rumford. The fountain. I, I remember that fountain, said the space wanderer gropingly. Only, 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 said Rumford. It was dry then, whenever that was. It's so wet now, said the space wanderer. This also reminds me, I don't know, this might be more symbolism too. You might recall that when, if you did the reading, which some of you maybe did, some of you, <laughs> but like uh, when he shows up, what do they do with the fire, uh, uh, the fire uh, engine or whatever, the fire truck if this is completely spontaneous and not and not uh predicted 
they take the hose. Do you remember they take the hose and spray it up in the air? And then all the water comes down and it's like really joyous and everyone's all happy and whatever. So um, I don't know if that's some sort of thing here too, right? The water flowing and all this and everyone's all happy. A lot of symbolism you could sort of find in there. So, so he remembers the fountain. That's the one thing that looks familiar. Because remember at the beginning of the book, it was dry and he climbed to the top of it. So maybe that, that sort of that memory still kind of lodged in there somewhere. Anything else familiar, Space Wanderer, said Rumford? Yes, said the Space Wanderer shyly. You. I am familiar, said Rumford archly. You mean there's a possibility that I played some small part in your life before? I remember you on Mars, said the Space Wanderer. You were the man with the dog just before we took off. What happened after you took off, said Rumford. Something went wrong, said the Space Wanderer. He sounded apologetic, all as though the series of misfortunes were somehow his own fault. A lot of things went wrong. Have you ever considered the possibility, said Rumford, that everything went absolutely right? No, said the Space Wanderer simply. The idea did not startle him, could not startle him, since the idea proposed was so far beyond the range of his jerry-built philosophy. Would you recognize your mate and child, said Rumford? I, I don't know, said the Space Wanderer. Bring me the woman and the boy who sell Malachi's outside the little iron door, said Rumford. Bring B and Chrono. So they bring him in. And that wasn't what I was looking for, but it's good that we read that. Um, I'm going to look for this, this speech. I don't want to read the whole thing because it's long. I'm trying to find a good place to, to jump in here. The speech where he kind of just chastises uh, uh, Malachi. This is at the beginning of chapter 11, I guess. We hate you, Malachi Constant, because. And so he says, this is how the sermon went. We are disgusted by Malachi Constant, said Winston Nile Rumford. Up to this, up in his treetop. Yeah, that's right. He climbs up to this tree. You can't even see him, so it's like a tree is talking or something. That's <laughs> weird. It's like we're disgusted by Malachi Constant because because he used the fantastic fruits of his fantastic good luck to finance an unending demonstration that man is a pig. He wallowed in sycophants. He wallowed in worthless women. He wallowed in lascivious entertainments and alcohol and drugs. He wallowed in every known form of voluptuous ter turpitude. At the height of his good luck, Malachi Constant was with, worth more than the states of Utah and North Dakota combined. Yet, I dare say, his moral worth was not that of the most corrupt little field mouse in either state. We are angered by Malachi Constant, said Rumford up in his treetop, because he did nothing to deserve his billions, and because he did nothing unselfish or imaginative with his billions. He was as benevolent as Marie Antoinette, not very benevolent, uh, as, a create, as creative as a professor of cosmetology in an embalming college. We hate Malachi Constant, said Rumford up in his treetop, because he accepted the fantastic fruits of his fantastic good luck without any qualm, as though luck were the hand of God. To us of the church of the God of, utterly, of the utterly indifferent, there's nothing more cruel, more dangerous, more blasphemous that a man can do than to believe that luck, good or bad, is the hand of God. So I suppose he's, his, his sin, at least so far, is being too lucky, and that's fine if you're lucky, but not sharing it, I guess, with, with enough, right? He, he, he wasn't, he did nothing unselfish or imaginative with his billions. Everything he did was for his own selfish, I'm bored, I want to go get some woman and womanize her. I'm bored, I'm going to go get drunk and have a party. I'm bored, I'm going to go and do this. I, 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 me, me, me. Where, where's my purpose? I want purpose. I want a mission. I want a message. I'm the faithful messenger. Me, 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 me. Right? And he had everything, but yet it was all still thinking from his own. And, 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 and not only was, it, was he not unselfish, but he was unimaginative. Like, this is another thing that pisses me off about people like Jeff Bezos. It's like, dude, all you can think about is just flying a rocket into space. 
There's so many freaking problems with this world. You've got enough money. You're worth more than like countries. Like this book is a little outdated. I think if he's, if he's writing the, the, the book today, he'd say, you are worth more than, the, than the, the country of Venezuela and the country of whatever. Like those people are worth more than some countries, right? Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos are worth more money than a lot of countries. In, in like Africa or like parts, um, y'all are looking at me weird. No, it's true, look it up. There are economies in the world that are smaller. The country of Yemen, I'm willing to bet money, is worth less money than Jeff Bezos, at least on paper, right? Maybe not re reality, I think that the country's worth more than a person, but the way that we value things and the way that we, oh, he's, he's going this much stock and this much, so he's worth this much, you know? But like, so it's like, okay, great, but what are you gonna do with it, you know? At least I guess Bill Gates pretends to help people. <laughs> like, I'm gonna start this foundation, and, you know. Like, at least he tried to like. like what if, I think Bezos just gave his money away recently. He gave like twenty billion or twenty million to just a couple people, and said, I, "I like this guy, so I'm gonna give him money and do whatever you want with it." That guy Van Jones or whatever. The the uh, he's a political commentator, Van Jones. He's just a guy on CNN and. Bezos like, I like that guy. Here, here's 40 million uh, and just do charitable work with it. It's like, you're so smart, you're, you're like this brilliant businessman and the most imaginative thing you can think of is just giving money away? Like, I can think of a million things I could do to make the world better, right? If I had, a, if I had unlimited money, like all the money like that he has, there's tons of stuff I can think of to do. Like first off, I'd go to Flint, Michigan and rip out all those rusty freaking water pipes and put in some fresh water so people can have freaking drinking water that's not full of poison and lead. But no, that's not as cool as going to Mars and wasting money on a freaking rocket ship. But what do I know? <laughs> yeah, but this is sort of, this is sort of, I guess maybe where I sort of relate a bit to this sort of hatred of Malachi Constant or whatever. He's like, you were lucky, which is fine. You don't have any control over that, right? You know, but you thought it was God liked you. Like you're special, right? In fact, he says, you know, what is it? There must be someone up there that likes me. You know, he's like, you even said that. You said that. It must be somebody that likes me, I guess. It's like, no, you just freaking got lucky. So you should sort of like, Help other people out that aren't, I suppose. Or at least use your imagination to do something cool. You know? Instead of being some boring old, I'm, I'm going to rocket ship, that'd be cool. We hate Malachi Constant because he accepted the fantastic fruits of his good luck without a qualm, as though luck were the hand of God. I already read that. Luck, good or bad, is not the hand of God. Luck is the way the wind swirls and the dust settles eons after God has passed by. Space Wanderer called Rumful, Rumford from up in his treetop. The Space Wanderer was not paying strict attention. His powers of concentration were feeble, possibly because he had been in the caves too long or on goofballs too long or in the army of Mars for too long. He was watching clouds. They were lovely things. And the sky they drifted in was to the color star of Space Wanderer, a thrilling blue. Space Wanderer called Rumford again. You in the yellow suit, said B. She nudged him. Wake up. P Pardon me, said the space wanderer. Space wanderer called, called Rumsford. He snapped to attention. Yes, sir, he called up into the leafy bower. The greeting was in, uh, ingenuous, cheerful, and winsome. A microphone on the end of a boom swung to dangle before him. Space wanderer called Rumsford. He was, he was peeved now, for the ceremonial flow was being impeded. Right here, sir, cried the space wanderer. His reply boomed, ear splittingly from the loudspeaker. Who are you, said Rumford. What is your real name? I don't know my real name, said the space wanderer. They call me Unk. What happened to you before you arrived back on Earth, Unk? The space wanderer beamed. He had been led to a repetition of the simple statement that had caused so much laughing and dancing and singing on Cape Cod. I was a victim of a series of accidents, as are we all. There was no laughing and dancing and singing this time, but the crowd was definitely in favor of what the space wanderer had said. Chins were raised, eyes widened, nostrils were flared. There was no outcry, for the crowd wanted to hear absolutely everything that Rumford and the space wanderer might have to say. A victim of a series of accidents, were you? said Rumford up in his treetop. Of all the accidents, he said, which would you consider the most significant? The space wanderer cocked his head. I'd have to think, he said. I'll spare you the trouble, said Rumford. 
The most significant accident that happened to you was your being born. Would you like me to tell you what you were named when you were born? The space wanderer hesitated only a moment, and all that made him hesitate was the fear that he was going to spoil a very gratifying ceremonial career by saying the wrong thing. Please do, he said. They called you Malachi Constant, said Rumford up in his treetop. And this kind of gets a bit of a, you know, reaction from the crowd. You know, they're like, oh, crap. Like, you're the guy that we've been, like, hanging in effigy, you know, like, as part of our religion, you know, I didn't know that. You know, so they're kind of taken aback <clears throat> by this. Uh, and then and he continues with his sermon. He says, you have had the singular accident, Mr. Constant, of becoming a central symbol of wrongheadedness for a perfectly enormous religious sect. So again, the Malachi's are supposed to resemble wrongheadedness, right? That, the kind of life that he led. You would not be attractive to us as a symbol, Mr. Constant, if our hearts did not go out to you to a certain extent. Our hearts have to go out to you, since all your flamboyant errors are errors that human beings have made since the beginning of time. In a few minutes, Mr. Constant, you're going to walk down the catwalks and ramps to that long golden ladder. You're going to climb that ladder. And you're going to get into that spaceship, and you're going to fly away to Titan, a warm and fecund moon of Saturn. You will live there in safety and comfort, but in exile from your native earth. You're gonna do this voluntarily, Mr. Constant, so that the Church of God, the utterly indifferent, can have a drama of dignified self-sacrifice to remember and ponder through all time. We will imagine to our spiritual satisfaction that you are talking all mistake, you're taking all mistaken ideas about the meaning of luck, all misused wealth and power, and all disgusting pastimes with you. The man who had been Malachi Constant, who had been Unk, who had been the space wanderer, the man who was Malachi Constant again, that man felt very little upon being declared Malachi Constant again. He might possibly have felt some interesting things had Rumford's timing been different, but Rumford told him what his ordeal was to be only seconds after telling him that he was Malachi Constant, and the ordeal was sufficiently ghastly to command Constant's full attention. The ordeal had been promised not in years or months or days, but in minutes. And like any condemned criminal, Malachi Constant became a student, to the exclusion of all else, of the apparatus on which he was about to perform. Curiously, his first worry was that he would stumble, that he would think too hard about the simple matter of walking, that his feet would cease to work naturally, that he would stumble on those wooden feet. You won't stumble, Mr. Constant, said Rumford up in his treetop, reading Constant's mind. There's nowhere else for you to go, nothing else for you to do. By putting one foot in front of the other, while we watch in silence, you will make of yourself the most memorable, magnificent, and meaningful human beings of all of modern times. Constant turned to look at his dusky, dusky mate and child. Their, their gazes were direct. Constant learned from their gazes that Rumford had spoken the truth, that no course save the course to the spaceship was open to him. And this is where, uh, oh, geez, I missed it. Didn't I miss it? He, tell, he, what is he, he tells them something that's pretty, pretty sad. Okay, this is later, right? He, he turns the snare drum on in his head to kind of help him to keep moving to the, to, to the spaceship. Um, but then he stops him. He says, you have something you'd like to say, Mr. Constant, before you go up on the ladder? And the microphone comes in front of the space. You're about to say something, Mr. Constant? If you're gonna talk, speak in a perfectly normal tone and keep your lips about six inches away from the microphone. You're gonna to speak to us? It, it's probably not worth saying, said Constant quietly, but I'd still like to say that I haven't understood a single thing that's happened to me since I reached Earth. You haven't got the, that feeling of participation, said Rumford up in his treetop. Is that it? It doesn't matter, said Constant. I'm still gonna go up the ladder. Well, said Rumford up in, his, uh, up in his treetop, if you feel we're doing you some sort of injustice here, suppose you tell us something really good that you've done at some point in your life and let us decide whether that piece of goodness might excuse you from the thing that we have planned for you. Goodness, said Constant. Yes, said Rumford expansively. Tell me one good thing you ever did in your life. 
what you can remember of it. Constant thought hard. His principal memories were of scuttling through endless corridors in the caves. There had been a few opportunities for what might pass for goodness with Boaz and the harmoniums, but Constant could not say honestly that he had availed himself of these opportunities to be good. So he thought about Mars, about all the things that had been contained in his letter to himself. Surely among all those items, there was something about his own goodness. And then he remembered Stoney Stevenson, his friend. He had had a friend, which was certainly a good thing. I had a friend, said Malachi Constant into the microphone. What was his name, said Rumford. Stoney Stevenson, said Constant. Just one friend, said Rumford up in his treetop. Just one, said Constant. His poor soul was flooded with pleasure as he realized that one friend was all that a man needed in order to be well equipped with friendship. So your claim of goodness would stand or fall, really, depending on how good a friend you really were to this Stony Stevenson. Yes, said Constant. Do you recall an execution on Mars, Mr. Constant, wherein you were the executioner? You strangled a man at the stake before three regiments of the Army of Mars. This was one memory that Constant had done his best to eradicate. He had been successful to a large extent, and the rummaging he did through his mind now was sincere. He couldn't be sure that the execution had taken place. I, I think I remember, said Constant. Well, that man you strangled was your great and good friend, Stoney Stevenson, said Winston Niles Rumford. Malachi Constant wept as he climbed the, glided la the gilded ladder. He paused halfway up and Rumford called to him again through the loudspeakers. Feel more like a vilely interested participant now, Mr. Constant? Rumford called out. Mr. Constant did. He had a thorough understanding now of his own worthlessness and a bitter sympathy for anyone who might find it good to handle him roughly. And when he got to the top, he was told by Rumford not to close the airlock yet because his mate and child would be up shortly. So now he's going to talk about B. So we get this, you know, this, this scathing speech about Malachi or Unk or whatever you want to call him, right? What, what a miserable person he is. And now he finally finds out that he murdered his own best friend. So now he kind of like feels like he is a crummy person. And he's like, okay, all right, I guess I'm going to go live on Titan for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and he, he sees his, his mate and the child and he's like, he, you know, she's like toothless, like one eye, like the kid's a little brat. And he's just like, this is what I was looking for, okay? Remember he was told though by Rumford, and Rumford lies, so sometimes he lies. He'll say something that's not truthful to get people to do the right thing to, you know, so the plan works out. But I don't think this is a lie. He's, he told him he's gonna fall in love with B, that they're gonna fall in love when they get to Titan. So, kind of far-fetched, but we'll see how that works out in the last couple chapters. But yeah, he looks at him like, okay, these, this is my wife and my kid, okay. But when he hears that he killed Stoney, he's kind of like, then he, he's like, oh crap, okay, I'm gonna go, I guess I'll go to the spaceship. But what's wrong with B? What does she get chastised for? Um, he says, Mount, this is Rumford again. I shall tell you now about B, the woman who sells Malachi's um, outside the gate, the dark woman who with her son now glowers at us all. While she was on en route to Mars so many years ago, Malachi Constant forced his attention on her, and she bore him this son. Before then, she was my wife and the mistress of this estate. Her true name is Beatrice Rumford. A groan went up from the crowd. Was it any wonder that the dusty puppets of other religions had been put away for want of audiences, that all eyes were now turned to Newport? Not only was the head of the Church of God the utterly indifferent capable of telling the future and finding the cruelest inequalities of all, inequalities in luck, but his supply of dumbfounding new sensations was inexhaustible. Skipping forward there, back to his speech, he says, I now invite you to despise the example of her life, as you have so long despised the example of the life of Malachi Constant. Hang her alongside Malachi Constant from your window blinds and light fixtures, if you will. The excesses of Beatrice were excesses of reluctance. 
I like that. I need to write that down, right? I don't know. Malachi, they were just excesses. The word excess, when you think excess, you're thinking of what he's doing. You're thinking of getting too drunk or partying or whatever. But she was, she, her, her excess was excess of reluctance, right? B had an excess of reluctance. This reminds me a bit about, there's a passage from uh, Dostoevsky, one of his greatest books that's not quite as celebrated as his others, The Possessed or Demons, as it's sometimes translated. There's a scene where um, one of the characters is having a bit of an existential crisis and he goes to talk to a holy man, uh, a priest or bishop or something. And I, I don't remember the Bible passage, so if somebody knows, help me out. I think it's from John. It might, it might actually be from Revelations. But it says something like, God wants you to be either hot or cold. God doesn't want you to be lukewarm. You know, don't be lukewarm. You, you know that passage I'm talking about? Yeah, I think it's in John. I don't know. Okay, don't quote me on that. It's definitely from the Bible. It's either John or Revelation. But anyway, well, John wrote the Revelation. John the Revelator. Of course, of course, there's supposed to be two different Johns, though. Well, it depends on who you talk to. But most scholars think they're two different Johns. But, um, yeah, the idea is don't be lukewarm. Be hot or cold, right? I guess Malachi's too hot and like bees like just lukewarm like she has no she's just she's got reluctance she doesn't want to get dirty she doesn't want to get involved she just she just wants to stay like away from life pretty much and just become not involved and not get her pretty white dress sullied right you know that's the sort of idea so her sin was a sin of reluctance right excess actually of reluctance as a younger woman, she felt so exquisitely bred as to do nothing and to allow nothing to be done to her for fear of contamination. Life for Beatrice as a younger woman was too full of germs and vulgarity to be anything but intolerable. So she's like this like germaphobe, afraid of everything, won't live. She can't live in that sort of state. She, in fact, she wouldn't want to. She's like, I want to live in a hermetically sealed, like germless environment that's completely, I forgot, there was an old science fiction show in the in the 80s when I was a kid, I can't remember it, but I remember one episode, This there was a doctor who was like super paranoid of germs, and he lived in like this completely white house, so like if there's any dirt, he could see it, and he was always wearing like masks, and everything was filtered, and if anybody came to visit, they'd have to be behind some glass wall, and like he was just so paranoid of getting any sort of contamination or whatnot, like that's Beatrice basically, right, at least that's how she's, uh, portrayed here. Um, we of the church of God, the utterly indifferent, damn her as roundly for refusing to risk her imagined purity in living as we damn Malachi constant for wallowing in filth, right? So he's too filthy, Malachi's too filthy, she's too clean, I guess, right? You gotta get a little dirty, but don't be a pig, I guess, is the, the moral of the story, right? Yeah. You gotta get a little dirty, but don't be it was implicit in Beatrice's every attitude that she was intellectually, morally, and physically what God intended human beings to be when perfected, and that the rest of humanity needed another 10,000 years just to catch up with her. Again, we have a case of an ordinary and uncreative person's tickling God Almighty peak. Right? God would laugh at this. What a, she thinks, oh, I'm more God-like. I'm so perfect. And he's like, I don't care what you do. So what? This is performance art. You're just going, this is patting yourself on the back kind of thing. At least that's what I'm getting out of this. Again, um, the proposition that God Almighty admired Beatrice for her touch-me-not breathing is at least as questionable as the proposition that God Almighty wanted Malachi to be rich. Mrs. Rumford, I now invite you and your son to follow Malachi Constant into the spaceship bound for Titan. Is there something you would like to say before you leave? There was a long silence in which mother and son drew closer together and looked shoulder to shoulder at a world which cha much changed by the news of the day. Are you planning to address us, Mrs. Rumford? Yes, said Beatrice, but it won't take me long. I believe everything you say about me is true since you so seldom lie. But when my son and I walk together to that ladder and climb it, we'll not be doing it for you or for your silly crowd. 
we'll be doing it for ourselves. And we'll be providing to ourselves, or proving to ourselves, and to anybody who wants to watch, that we aren't afraid of anything. Our hearts won't be breaking when we leave this planet. It disgusts us at least as much as we, under your guidance, disgust it. I do not recall the old days, said Beatrice, when I was mistress of this estate, when I could not stand to do anything or to have anything done to me. But I loved myself the instant you told me I'd been that way. The human race is a scummy thing, and so is Earth, and so are you. <laughs> and then she gets up in the spaceship and flies off, right? So she's what you would call a misanthrope. And some, some people say that Vonnegut is a misanthrope, and I disagree. I can see why people would say that about him, because he does talk about humans pretty negatively sometimes, right? What does it mean to be misanthropic? What's a misanthrope? Misanthropy. Anybody familiar with that word, misanthropic? It's just a fancy way for saying you hate people. Hatred for humans. Right? And some would argue that Vonnegut is a misanthrope, that he's like, we're all just pathetic. We're, you know, look how horrible we are. We should just laugh at ourselves for how stupid we think we're, we're, we think we're so dignified and special. Look at what a farce the human race is. I don't think that's Vonnegut. No. I think, you know, he sees that that's part of us, that we can be pretty freaking horrible. We can be pretty comical and absurd, but there's a lot of beauty in the world. Next week, I think, I'm gonna try to find it. He gave a lecture that's not really long. I'll try to remember, I'll play it for you on Monday when we have a classroom where I can figure out the projector. So uh, I'll, I'll try to play for you, but there's, there's a, a lecture where he talks about, um, I wouldn't say the meaning of life, but just sort of finding joy in little things. So I, I, you know, I don't think Vonna gets a misanthrope, but certainly B is, at least by the time she leaves the planet Earth, she's like, yeah, I am better than all you guys. <laughs> you know? I don't think she's quite learned her lesson. Okay? But we'll see, I think maybe she will learn some sort of a lesson on Titan. And Malachi will learn a lesson, too. Apparently, he's going to learn the meaning of life uh, when he gets to Titan. And then we'll finally get an answer to the question of what it's all about, okay? uh, at least according to our author, what he thinks it's all about. But I think there's already clues throughout the book. You know, I already mentioned last class, Boaz is kind of seems to be the best character so far to sort of have dealt with the luck or lack thereof that he's been dealt. So anyway. Well, I said I'd let you guys go early. I think today I actually will. So um, not super early, but at least 10 minutes. Uh, any comments, questions? No? So don't forget, this weekend, finish reading the novel. We only got like one, well, two chapters really, because the last chapter is the epilogue and it's kind of in its own chapter. So 12, chapter 12 and the epilogue, finish it. We'll probably spend most of next week on Vonnegut, even though we'll be done reading it. We'll spend time discussing it, wrapping things up. Don't forget your paper, your essay, your Vonnegut essay will be due at the end of the week next week. I'm going to stop the video.